Okay, so what you've seen is the geographic line. Let's let's talk about that first. The geographic North Pole. Mm -hmm. The geographic North Pole. Here's our planet. Mm -hmm. And you have the North Pole and you have the South Pole. Correct. This is where and let me step out of this one. This is where the and I want to send you a um I want to send you an image. Okay. So here's an image coming to you. You can see the prime meridian in this image that I'm about to send you. Let me know when you see the image. It's coming to you now. There we go. Okay. So those are yeah. those lines, those vertical lines, lines of longitude. Mm -hmm. And they all go to the north and the south pole. So yeah. the lines would run kind of like this. If you were looking directly over, and then they would kind of curve like this because our globe is circular. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, <clears throat> you could never, ever use a magnetic compass to fly to the North and the South Pole. And the reason why, because we have a magnetic North Pole, which is, I think, 1,800 miles away from the geographic North Pole. The magnetic North and South Pole is where the magnetic fields The magnetic field of the Earth kind of goes to magnetic north and magnetic south, not geographic mm -hmm. north and geographic south. So as a pilot, you could never, ever use your magnetic compass to fly to true north. This is called true north, and it's called mm -hmm. magnetic north. True south, magnetic south pole. So true north on the magnetic north. Hmm. Okay, so true south of the south pole, the magnetic okay. So what they've done on the charts, on the aviation charts, is they put in these uh, isogonic lines or lines of magnetic variation. All right. And what these do is help you fly mm -hmm. to magnetic, the geographic north and south poles. So the phrase is east is least and west is best. On the chart, you saw eight and a half. You could use eight. Some people will use nine, but it's only a degree, one degree off. So it's not that bad. Okay. So if I'm trying to fly a heading of one zero zero degrees and I see eight east, I'm going to subtract eight and I'm going to fly zero nine two degrees in order to fly a true heading. So what, is, what does it mean, true heading? What does that mean? Your true heading is, and let me give you a good aviation definition. Because from all the books I've read so far, like for the aviation part, like none of them mention true heading. They briefly mention what's magnetic north and true north. But that's pretty much it. So, like, when I got the test on the practice, when I got the question on the practice test, I was kind of caught off guard. You know, what is this? Okay. Um, true north, a true heading is the heading that you're flying in relation to true north, which is the, the geographic north pole. Setting your flying to regardless of true. So as you fly over the Earth's surface, there's a couple things that need to be taken in, into consideration. All right, this, this is one of the things that needs to be taken into consideration. Um, your isogonic lines. Because your magnetic compass is 
a north magnetic north seeking instrument. Okay. But your chart is geographic. All right. So mm -hmm. that's where the difference is, the difference comes in. All right. Um another thing you have to compensate for sometimes is winds. Because if I have winds blowing from the east, I can't fly true north. I'll, I'll actually be blown off course. So what I have to do is I'll actually have to crab into the wind, point into the wind a little bit in order to track so that my aircraft tracks properly over the ground. So if the wind is coming from this direction, I actually have to turn into the wind a little bit in order to track north. Because if I just flew the heading, I looked at the chart and I said, okay, well, the heading is north, 360, but I have winds. I'm actually going to fly off course. I won't mm -hmm. get to my destination. So you have to actually crab into the wind in order to properly get to your destination. Okay. So that's where uh, your true and magnetic yeah. Yeah. north and true and magnetic south come into play. So to answer your question, you know that east east is least and west is best. So let me blow this out and go to your question. If flying, I'm sorry, if magnetic north is a positive 15 degree variation. So you would see 15 W on the isogonic line that you are flying near or over. Mm -hmm. So it's 15 degrees from true north. To convert to true north, true north to magnetic north when flying eastbound, what adjustment, what is the adjustment a pilot must make to the magnetic compass? Well, you would, west is best, add 15 degrees to your heading. So in this case, if we were going to fly, if we were intended to fly 100 degrees, in this particular case situation, you would fly a heading of 115. You would add 15 degrees. Okay. So that's your, uh, so 115 is a true heading then? Mm-hmm. Okay. No, 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 no. Your true heading, your true heading would be 100. Your magnetic heading would be 115. Okay. Because that's what you're going to fly magnetically in order to go to true, to a true 100. So you just add a 15 degrees in? Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you have any more examples of these? Um, I mean, Let's go sky back there. Up, 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 up. So is true north always 100 degrees? No, no. No, okay. This is, uh, all right. I'm still kind of confused. I know, and this is why we're going to clear this up. <laughs> So let's say, and I'll put us in uh, San Diego. All right. So here's San Diego. Mm -hmm. All right. San Diego International. Put that in the plan. All right. Let's move you over. And we are going to go to. Okay. 
this airport. Okay. So <clears throat> the true course, the true course to this airport. Let me zoom in. This is Brawley Airport. All right. So the true course to this airport is 068 degrees. All right. It's 86 nautical miles away from San Diego. Mm -hmm. All right. Now. <clears throat> So that's your true course. Mm -hmm. So it is 86 miles and a heading of 068 degrees. That is our true course. Now, you got to look to see if there's any isogonic lines in that area. And there is. See this one? Yeah. All right. So east is least. Mm -hmm. So our isogonic line is negative 11. So we would actually try, have to fly a heading on our magnetic compass of 057 in order to track properly. So that's what those lines are depicted on the chart for. Mm -hmm. And so... So it's 068 minus negative 11. Mm -hmm. You have to subtract 11. That's what that line is telling you because you're going to be using your magnetic compass all of the time mm -hmm. um, in lighter and light aircraft. Now, is there such thing as having two isogonic lines in one route? Or one way? Um, all right. All right, now you see the magnetic compass up top here? Yeah. All right, it's that way because it's it's they're trying to get it as far away from the radios as possible. Because the radios mm -hmm. could cause some distortion. Um, and you have your heading indicator here, but there's a gyroscope in it. And what happens, the gyroscope just spins, 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 spins. So as a result, what happens is that card is going to slide a little bit. So every 15 minutes, you're going to have to readjust it to your mm -hmm. magnetic compass. And that's why it's so important. Primarily, you will be looking at the magnetic compass here. And I don't like this because it's a... Uh, Images. Right. I don't know if that will let me. Um... It's going to do the same thing, I think. Yeah. All right. So, um, some aircraft, the compass is up top here. It's way. It's well away from the radios. Mm -hmm. All right, but um. You know, this is just something you're relying on a magnetic north seeking instrument to fly over geographic north in a geographic north realm, if that makes any sense. Does it a little bit? Yeah. Because you're using a compass, but you got to keep in mind that magnetic north and true north are not the same location. So that's mm -hmm. why the adjustments are there for the isogonic inclines. Okay. Okay. So back to the question I asked earlier, uh, is there such thing as having two isogonic lines? Um, mm, not really. Right. This is this is what happens. There's more than one isogonic line. Yes, that is true. There is more than one isogonic line, but. Let me show you how they run. Variation. Okay. So here 
and I'll send you this image as well. So here you have 20 east, let me get that out of the way, 15 <laughs> east, 10 east, 5 east, 0, 5 west. So this is where we start adding on this side of the United States. 10 west, mm -hmm. 15 degrees west, and 20 degrees west. So you, you can have more than one isogotic line, but typically you're going to be flying north, south, east, or west. So down here, if we're flying northbound out of California up to Washington State, we're going to apply 15 degrees east, so we'll be subtracting 15 degrees. Mm -hmm. All right, and then when we get closer to Washington, then we would use 20. From mm -hmm. west to east or east to west, you're going to be making constant adjustments, aren't we? Because you're running over more than one isogonic line. Mm -hmm. So, so west you're adding, east you're subtracting. Mm -hmm. East is least and west is best. So what about if you're traveling from, let's say, from California all the way to Maine? So how would you take it in consideration? So, all right. So what would happen is you're leaving California, you would apply 15 degrees east, so you'd be subtracting 15 degrees. Then when mm -hmm. you got over in Nebraska, you would use 10. Then Subtract 10. Five. Subtract 5. Then when you get here, there is no magnetic variation. You could actually fly your compass settings mm -hmm. over the central or midwest, mid, no, that's central, I guess, U.S. Then when you get here, you will add. Five. five. You get over Jersey, you add okay, that makes sense. 10 all the way till you get to Maine. So you would just constantly be making adjustments because the magnetics, the magnet magnetic flux lines of the earth are working on your on your compass. You mm -hmm. just have to be aware of it. Now for short flights, it's really not a big deal, but for long distance flights, you have to be aware of this. Otherwise, you'll be way off target which is not okay. good because yeah. let's say your departure here is here and your destination is here, right? If I'm say five degrees off, by the time I get here, that's pretty, that's a pretty far distance, right? Mm -hmm. I'm way off. So what you would have to do is apply corrections along the way. And maybe your flight path will kind of maybe look like this a little bit. But I'd rather be doing this than this. You you run you say okay this trip is I don't know a thousand miles. Well, by the time you covered a thousand miles, you don't want to be eighty miles off target, a hundred miles or two hundred miles off target. That's why navigation is a very precise science. Okay. If you do it right. So. Um so, like going back to earlier from California to Maine, um, the heading indicator will let you know when you're, when you're passing 15, 10, no, 5. No, no, it will not. It will not. This is why you have your charts. Mm. Because as we fly along, we have 11 degrees of magnetic variation there. And I don't know why this is taking so long. Oh, because I'm in sectional. We're all three apart. Okay. So as we're flying along here, now we have 10 and a half. We keep flying. We get over, it's crazy, I can't even find, okay, six degrees east now. Mm -hmm. All right, so you see it's getting lower and lower and lower until we get to the central United States. We're flying, we're flying, we're flying. So you have to keep updating yourself via your charts and things of that nature. Now we have four degrees west. Okay, just zoom it out. When we get right about here. West is best. <laughs> Nine. So it's getting so. 
you keep now it's 11 so you keep yeah. making adjustments as you fly along or as you go through your route of flight and then eventually like you said you will wind up in Maine mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, yeah, that's me. Banger, banger me. Bang over. And by the time we get here, we have 17 degrees west that we will be <laughs> adding to our heading. So it varies in different uh, portions of the earth, as you can see here. And I forgot to send that to you. All right. All right. Any questions? No, oh, I just gotta review this and then kinda uh, do more practice problems mm -hmm. regarding to the question, the one, the one I sent you. Right. Now, all runways are labeled in relation to magnetic north. Yeah, correct. The numbers, right? Mm -hmm. the bottom numbers, yeah. Mm -hmm. the numbers in the runway. And this is pretty cool. Um, here you can see magnetic north. We're looking at the globe from the top. So mm -hmm. you can see where all the all the longitudinal lines go to true north. But magnetic north is right about here. That's where the magnetic flux lines of the earth go. Yeah. It's true north. Mm -hmm. And it's MN for like magnetic north. That's why we have isoconic lines to keep ourselves properly uh, tracking. All right. So you went over chapter three. Correct. And um, where is you? What was some of the things you took from chapter three? What was like the main, the main message they took? Or? Well, I mean, you know, what were some of the things they talked about? Oh, well, um, the attitude envelope or the attitude axis, which is the longitudinal, vertical, and lateral, and how the ailerons affect the longitudinal roll axis. I mean, you and roll, then the elevators. You, you roll. You roll about the. You roll about the longitudinal axis with your ailerons. Right. So, so that makes the plane kind of roll like this. We call that a rolling motion. Pitch. What about pitch? We pitch about That's the lateral elevators. Axis. elevators. 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 And yaw. Yaw is your uh, rudder. Very vertical good. rudder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I learned that. I also learned about the tricycle uh, landing gear, the conventional landing gear, the different types of drag. Mm -hmm. um, what is the nickname uh, for conventional landing gear? Conventional. They're called also called tail draggers. Very good. Basically, have the third wheel in the in the tail of the plane. Mm -hmm. and then I also learned about the um the different type of um tails. There's semi monaco, or I think I'm saying it wrong. Semi monaco and then monaco. Monocoque. Monocoque. <laughs> <laughs> so semi monocoque and then monocoque, mm -hmm. and then all the formers, the stringers, the bulkheads. Okay, yeah, um, so basically air, aircraft construction. Yeah. Um, what about the five major components? What are the five major components of an airplane? Oh, that's, uh, you have the wings, you have the cockpit, you got the fuselage, you get the tail assembly, and the power plant, 
the power plant. We call it power plant because it, it doesn't only supply power or thrust to the engine, but it also helps with electricity, hydraulics. Um, it keeps the the cockpit pressurized. Mm -hmm. on that, that stuff. Good, good, good. Okay. Um, good, 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 good stuff. Okay. All right. And then about Bernoulli's principle. Okay. Good. So you should be going into chapter four. I don't know if you went ahead and went into chapter four. Yeah, I did. All right. Good, 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 good. Because that's where Bernoulli's principle is. And um, what is Bernoulli's principle? State Bernoulli's principle. Bernoulli's principle. It's, um, I know you told me the, the exact definition, but mm. it's, um, when there's a when there's high speed, there's low pressure. Okay. And then the opposite is basically true. When there's high pressure, there's low speed. So if you were to draw the airfoil of a wing, the top portion would be um, fast because there's a fast wind on top. So that means okay, low so pressure. Here's how I want you to state Bernoulli's principle: as the velocity of a fluid increases, its internal pressure decreases. As the velocity of a fluid increases, its internal pressure decreases. So as the velocity of fluid increases, internal pressure increases. That's very nice. So the Venturi, the Venturi tube is the tool or device that we use to demonstrate Bernoulli's principle. Correct. All right. Um, atmospheric pressure. All right. In a standard atmosphere, in a standard atmosphere at sea mm -hmm. level, it should be 15 degrees Celsius or 59 degrees Fahrenheit. That's temperature, right? That's your mm -hmm. temperature. In the text, uh, it covers uh, standard sea level pressure. So at sea level, and I'll put this barometer up here. On your timeline. That is the atmosphere pushing down on Mercury. Mm -hmm. And then there's a column, a tube. And when the atmosphere, when that tube and that this this container of mercury and the tube or are, are at sea level, the atmospheric pressure is supposed to push the mercury up the column approximately 29.92 inches. So mm -hmm. we call sea level pressure 2992 inches HG. HG is the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, periodic table element or the symbol on the periodic table for mercury. All right. Or sometimes it's measured in millibars. 10132 millibars. Right. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that's uh, referred to as that. So it's so at sea level, these are our standard um, values, our standard values for the atmosphere in a perfect atmosphere. This is how the aircraft instruments are calibrated. Now, there's something that we also need to be familiar with, and this is called standard lapse rate. Standard lapse rate. Again, in a perfect atmosphere, which never really exists, mm -hmm. or almost never exists. Um, we're here at sea level. If we were in a space shuttle,
No laugh at my artwork. All right. As this space shuttle takes off into the air, every 1,000 feet, we should have a change in temperature. Mm -hmm. Right. We should lose 2 degrees Celsius. Every 1,000. Or 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit every 1,000 feet. Mm -hmm. So the standard value is 15 degrees Celsius or 59 degrees Fahrenheit at sea level. So every 1,000 feet that this space shuttle is climbing, we should be losing 2 degrees Celsius or 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit. This is called the standard lapse rate. All right. Mm -hmm. And this is why the troposphere is the troposphere, which is the lowest level of the atmosphere. Yeah. All right. There's a Greek root or Latin root trope. Trope means to change. It means to change. So we get temperature changes in the troposphere. Mm -hmm. When we get to the edge of the troposphere, we get to the tropopause. That's what it's called. Troposphere, the edge of the troposphere is the tropopause. So the change pauses. Mm -hmm. I am going to, where are you? All right. There you go. All right. This is from the book called The Aerodynamics for Naval Aviators. And basically, uh, there's an image I just sent you. Okay, so we can see the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. All right, and roughly we're losing three and a half you see on the, on the side, you see the altitude, 1,000, yeah. 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so we're, we should be losing about 3.5 degrees per 1,000 feet, and that's roughly what's going on here. Um, but you see the star at 36,089, whatever that is, right? If you go down to the bottom of the chart, you see the geopotential of the tropopause. Now, I want you to notice something about the temperatures. Stay the same. After you reach the tropopause. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. We go from sea level, we're 59 degrees Fahrenheit. We go to 10,000, we're at 23 degrees Fahrenheit. This temperature change keeps going. At 20,000, we're at negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit. And then at 36,000 plus feet, it goes to negative 69.7, neg almost negative 70 degrees. Mm -hmm. Now, do you notice as we keep increasing altitude, the temperature change stops, doesn't it? Yeah. This changes after the tropopause. So the change stops in temperature. And this yeah. is why we have all the weather kind of down by us because of all the temperature changes. Most, or I'll say all weather phenomenon is driven by temperature change. Okay. Um, the pressure ratio, they're giving you a ratio, but you can also see that the atmospheric pressure is decreasing as well, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, Same thing for the speed of sound of knot and knots. Mm -hmm. It's constant. Yeah. The speed of sound actually from sea level is at sea level is 661 knots. Yeah. As we increase altitude, the speed of sound decreases. Why do you think that is? Because there's a, the air is less dense. Uh, there's fewer 
oxygen atoms, just basically atoms in general. So therefore, um, there is enough lift for the airplane. Okay, I'll take that. Uh, I'll take uh, that. Um, I would have stayed with a uh, less air molecules, or they're not as packed. They're not packed as tightly together. Mm -hmm. So, what does sound need? We need we need air molecules for sound. Mm -hmm. All right, because it is actually the vibration. You're vibrating. I'm, vi I'm vibrating air molecules. They're going into the mic here. They're coming to your speaker. The speaker is actually vibrating the air molecules, and you're hearing what I'm saying. Yeah. All right. That was also a test question. Does the speed of sound uh, increase or decrease as altitude is increased? And the speed of sound decreases as altitude is increased. Yeah. The density also decreases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the air is not as dense. But the kinematic viscosity increases, though. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to go that deep. Okay. You don't need to go into kinematic viscosity. <clears throat> All right. So, what you need to understand is um, we're pretty much down here by sea level. When my diaphragm expands, the air just kind of rushes in to my mm -hmm. lungs. It's easier to breathe. All right, at 30,000 feet, not so much. All right, because you're at a high altitude, less air yeah. pressure, less air density. And what happens is it's very hard to breathe. And that's why supplemental oxygen is required above 10,000 feet. The human mm -hmm. body was, the human body was really not desired to be at altitudes of 20, 30,000 feet. Actually, no living thing. Is it's supposed to be at that altitude? Hmm. This is why mountain well, climbers. You ever see those high altitude mountain climbers? They bring oxygen. I mean, yeah, they bring oxygen with them. Really? Yeah. Like what about when they go to like Mount Everest? Do they need oxygen masks there too? I don't know how high is Mount Everest. The peak. Yeah. Google, Google it. Everything's Google. Yeah. It's 29,000 feet. Yes. So, so yeah, you definitely need it. Yeah, you definitely need oxygen. If you're going to climb to the peak. If yeah. you're just going to go up to a portion that's like 10,000 feet, no. But you will notice signs of hypoxia. And hypoxia is another aviation and nautical. Uh, what is hypoxia? Basically, the lack of oxygen into the body. Into the bloodstream. So if you have a diminished amount of oxygen getting into your bloodstream, you think you're going to function well? Nope. Nope. Probably fall asleep. Yeah. <clears throat> have you ever seen a movie called An Officer and a Gentleman? Officer and a Gentleman? Mm -hmm. And a Gentleman? Yeah. No, I haven't. Okay. Um, you might want to look that up. Okay. The... It's actually it's a Navy movie, mm -hmm. and the guys are they're they're aviation officer candidates, and mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's probably why you want to check it out. But okay. they're aviation officer candidates, and what they do is they put them into something called an altitude chamber. Mm -hmm. Every couple of years, I go into an altitude chamber because I like to know what my symptoms are for hypoxia. I want to be able to recognize them quickly. Yeah, and and know what's going on. So, a lot of people they don't know if you don't go to an altitude chamber regularly. And as a naval aviator, you would be 
going, you would be going to now to camera on the regular. So you know what your symptoms are. There's a there's a whole list of symptoms that you can experience um, concerning hypoxia, but you might get dizzy. I might get nauseous. The next guy might feel muscular, you know, control. So you got to know what applies to you. Mm -hmm. That's correct. I think I think I've seen videos like where students go in, some start throwing up, some start uh, feeling nauseous or dizzy. Like mm -hmm. you said. Yeah. And the thing is, is they tell you because a lot of people try to be macho, but they tell you, listen, when you feel weird, just put your oxygen on. You know. Yeah. They'll t you take your mask off, you take the supplemental oxygen off. And then you'll just, they'll give you something to do. Like they'll give you a deck of cards or they'll tell you to write your name and they'll give you the deck of cards and be like, Ace of Spades, King of Diamonds, you know, but like at, at a sea level, they'll put you at 3,000 feet. You'll be like, Ace of Spades, King of Diamonds, 10 of Hearts, five of Clubs, three of Clubs. They'll put you at 15,000. You'll be like, Ace of Spades, King of Diamonds, 10 of heart, Hearts. When they put you at 45,000 feet, um, ace of spades, king of diamonds, and basically we just laugh at each other. I mean, seasoned pilots will just laugh at each other, kind of like, dude, you see you. <laughs> so it's really interesting to know what you're, and some people might, may not feel strong as they normally would. They can't think mm -hmm. clearly, but you have to know what you're especially when you're flying high-performance aircraft at, that go to these high altitudes. Um, if you don't fly at high altitudes, it's probably something you never need to worry about. Yeah. But when we get over areas like, let's see. Okay. Let me screen share with you. Now, on Sky Vector, there are, you can see altitudes. All right. Um, all right. Just the surface of this airport is 4,789 4, feet. That is the height above sea level. Mm hmm. So I'm going to hit 10,000 feet. If I leave the ground and fly up to 6,000 feet, I'm already in a bad oxygen situation. All right. And these grids, you have these dark blue, big and small numbers. Yep. These are called maximum elevation figures. The maximum elevation of anything in this particular grid is 9,500. Here's 10,100 in this area. The peaks, mm -hmm. the peaks come up that high. All right, let's look at some other stuff here. 10,000, 10,000, 12,000 if you're in this grid. 14,000, 13,000. Yeah. So if you're going to fly from here to here, you're going to need supplemental oxygen. Okay. You're not going to be hugging the ground because the mountain peaks are going to come up and get you. So you you need to be at least sixteen thousand feet in this area. Mm -hmm. It's mountainous terrain. Yeah. And if I lose my engine or something like that, I want options. If I'm at fifteen thousand feet, I got mountain peaks. Eight hundred feet. You know, yeah, four. Yeah, you see a fourteen too. So I don't have a lot of options. I'm like, whoa. Okay. Another thing, because of the decreased air density, you need either turbine turbocharged or supercharged engines mm -hmm. which is in your text because the air is thinner so this airplane is not going to fly like it's at sea level at sea level lots of air density the engine sucks in blows out the back mm -hmm. boom you yeah. got a lot of thrust up here not so much because you have decreased air density yeah so flying in this area you need to be flying the turbine supercharged turbocharged engine a normally aspirated engine is not going to perform well at these altitudes you'll just kind of be the engine's like dude we don't have it yeah 
And that's a so, scary feeling. What does manifold pressure has anything to do, do with that? Manifold does, pressure does, deals is is typically. Uh, let me go to because you need to be familiarized with the two types of. Uh, All right, so let's say we have, I'm, I'm still screen sharing with you, right? Yeah. All right, so let's just, uh, 172. This is like a light four-seater aircraft, right? Mm -hmm. And if we look at this, we have a throttle and a mixture control. This is a normally aspirated engine. So we control the throttle by watching the tachometer, uh, which tells you how fast your propeller is spinning. Now, when we get in the more advanced aircraft, um, let me just see, like a Cessna 182. 182RG. Right. This is a complex, complex aircraft. So in the 182RG, you're going to have a throttle control, a propeller control, and a mm -hmm. mixture control. Because in this situation, we have a constant speed prop. And what you're going to set your power by is your manifold pressure gauge. Mm -hmm. And um, let me just zoom in on a... Uh, a tachometer is the... Hmm. All right. So your your normal Cessna, the tachometer is going to look like this. All right. And this is actually a better version because you have what we call a green arc. This is the normal operating range. So when you push the propeller, it's going to idle should idle at a thousand. You should be cruising somewhere around twenty five hundred RPMs here. That's where you would be cruising. You never ever want to redline. Anything redlining in, in aviation is bad. Mm -hmm. All right. So this is your tachometer. And this normal, normally aspirated engine this is how you set your engine power. Now, when we move up to bigger and badder airplanes. then you will have a manifold pressure gauge, which they're not giving me very good of. Hmm. Yeah, they're not really giving me really good. Uh, but nonetheless, it's all good. I can... Um, Embraer, A36 Bonanza. I think if you go on page um, 15, or chapter 3, on page 15 on the pilot handbook, mm -hmm. they have a manifold pressure cage, and they also have a tachometer. Oh, tachometer. So in, in this system, you can see this manifold pressure gauge, right? Mm -hmm. The RPM. Now the propeller in this system, the propeller is set to RPM and the manifold pressure gauge is set to your power. Hold on, I'll kill that alarm in a minute. But down here, you have your actual gauges, your throttle, propeller control, and your mixture control. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a test question. How do you lean an aircraft? How do you lean it? 
Yeah. Like move in a forward direction? <laughs> no. I know. That's or what most people would think. How do you lean an aircraft? You lean an aircraft by... All right. Let me cockpit engine controls. Okay. So here's your throttle. Mm -hmm. All right. Here is your propeller. And here's your mixture control. As we increase altitude, we can actually lean the mixture. So as we pull this back, we're actually feeding less fuel to the engine. And we can do that at altitudes because the air density is thinner, right? Yeah. So we can burn less fuel. And so we have better fuel conservation that way. Yeah. Right. So in that case, if you put the mixture back, you got to increase the propeller? No. Uh, I, okay. No, you're just reducing the amount of fuel going to the cylinders in the aircraft in this particular case. Now, that's how you lean an aircraft. Mm. All right. A lot of people, they think it's the banking motion, though. When, when the question says, how do you lean an airplane? A lot of people that are not, you know, know nothing about aviation will think you're banking the aircraft. Okay. So All right. So what I want you to do is keep digging deeper into that uh, guide the handbook of aeronautical knowledge. This is the book of gaming, right? Yes, sir. So should, should I read which which chapter should I read in chapter 4? Yeah, they're going to 4 mm -hmm. Should I start reading chapter five too? Yes, five is relevant to what you need. Six and seven as well. You can go into eight if you like, but I give you everything you need as we go mm -hmm. along concerning flight instruments. So regarding to the other uh, two math and the mechanical portion, mm -hmm. We actually never went over mechanical portion, so I don't know. We're gonna Should go I over just... that. We're gonna go over that. Okay. Two, four, five, six, and seven. And then I think of actually maybe like do you have any more websites for practice tests for the math portion? I don't know. Um, <laughs> Let me, um. Because I've used Trivium right now. Mm -hmm. You run through all, every math question in that book? Uh, the one you get, the one you gave me? No, the Trivium. Yeah, I did actually. All the math one, yeah, I did actually did pretty well. Pretty good. well. Good, 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 good. Right. It seemed, I don't know, it seemed easy. I don't know, just like. But then again, I don't want to get you know cocky or too confident. No, you do not. That's not good. Yeah, that's, that's not good. <laughs> if they would drop something in your lap, you'd be like, what the? <clears throat> All, right. All right, here's a link I'm sending you. And uh, I'll screen share with you in a moment here. So you can kind of see how to navigate through this thing. But there's the link coming to you. And screen share. And that's on a timeline. So you don't have to write it down. It's on your timeline. It's not going to go anywhere. Okay. Did you have arithmetic reasoning? Did I do it? Yeah, I, did, I redid. Basically, the trivium has arithmetic reasoning. But and I'm just has, saying, there's uh, here, there's here, there's tests, there te there are tests here. Actually, okay. three of them here you can mess around with. Um, there's electronics information, mm -hmm. math knowledge, and mechanical comprehension. Okay. So you can you can you can play around with these. Anything you don't understand, we can talk about. Okay. Um, but I want you to more or less go through the the chapters of the pilot's handbook of aeronautical knowledge on your own. 
And okay. it's, as you come up, the things you don't understand, we'll discuss it. Because we're going to have mm -hmm. to start going into mechanical comprehension and the physics aspect of things. Yeah. So for the for the mechanical portion, is it basic? Because like the problems on the books are they seem pretty easy and pretty straightforward. Yeah, I give you what I've, I've th that I'll give you what's discussed in my debriefs. Okay. And this is actual like eyes on information, and I don't I don't ask people for specific questions. Just type of question. Okay. You know, so. Well, as long as you're well versed in the topics in the air in the physics areas that you know we debrief with, you know you should be okay. Like what topics would you, or just like simple like? Or? I mean kinematics, uh, energy, mm -hmm. lever systems. I mean a lot of stuff. Even the distance, rate, and time problems are physics questions. Yeah, they're physics questions. Because I know. Earlier, we're doing the, the math questions, you know, the the round trip. Uh-huh. Uh, expansion, delayed departure. Expansion. So, those are basically kind of like physics questions in a way. Mm-hmm. Mechanical. Like, okay. So, don't stop looking at that stuff. Make sure. No. You... Yeah, I'm pretty, um, I just don't know what to expect for February 20th. So go hit that. Um, here's some other things you can do on your own. Uh, I'll send you some links, some more links. Where are you? Here's another link for mechanical stuff. Oh, yeah, I actually use that website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good one. Mm -hmm. There's over 200 questions in this thing, I think. Yeah. So in addition to that, your Trivium should have mechanical comprehension stuff, right? Yeah, correct. Have you gone through all that? I just kind of glanced through it. Okay. But I think I, I think that they're doing because I did it a long time ago, like last year, mm -hmm. and I just started them again. Man. Okay, make sure you're on top of your game, bro. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we'll do. I well, appreciate it. Thanks for your help. Oh, no problem, man. Did you learn something today? Yeah, I just got to go over the the, one, the the true north and magnetic north. Mm -hmm. Probably look at videos on YouTube about it. And yeah, the tropo pause too. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so your test date is next week. Yeah, Wednesday. Next Wednesday. February 20th. Are we meeting? When are we meeting again? Um, Thursday or Friday? If that works with you. Yeah. I uh, just, I'll let you know by the end of today. Because, okay. Because like, I'm, go, I'm going back to work. Now. Okay. I got cleared by the doctor to go back to work. So I'm doing that. All right. So by tonight, I'll get my schedule and then I'll let you know. Okay. Sounds good? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. All right, have a great day. Right. You have a great day.